so um so this is me in my uh geeky science education days uh and so that culture and i just have like kind of just just for a little bit of uh lighter side of things i've got a bit of a video that kind of it well it, it's just kind of fun but it also adds to you know how that culture is if it decides to open okay when school isn't a place you have to be okay Okay, we might have to close that down since it's deciding to be really slow right now. Hang on a sec. Why oh. a school where remote learning can be as remote as you want? Like a okay, I'm gonna go. Okay, I will uh, leave that. Um, it was it was just really uh, something dorky anyhow, but you know, oh, there it is. It's still running spirals. So we'll just leave that. Um, it, it's kind of, um, and I don't know if anybody, I think Danielle's lived in that world before, but it's, it's a world where, um, where that whole idea of, uh, of um, Oh, I've got that on the still. I was setting up my camera earlier. Now I just need to find my slides back again. Where did they go? Uh, there we go. Um, it's a whole world where um, the the sort of the notion and the way the way you work is everybody you know kind of goes to everybody else's different parks programs they share their different things that they're doing whether it's like doing owl calls which is what um myself and glenn were doing here and uh um there's uh well just i'll do the geeky thing that was in the video um but uh it was something i learned off of one of the parks guys in bc was uh to do a barred owls call it sounds like who cooks for you who cooks for you who cooks for you all but um you do to do it properly you have to do it in stages so the first stage is sort of doing it with an english accent so who cooks for you who cooks for you who cooks for you all now if anybody feels like joining in no okay so the second stage is an english accent and peanut butter in your mouth so it's like who cooks for you? Who cooks for you? Who cooks for you all? And then the next stage is an English accent, peanut butter in your mouth, in your mouth in the shape of a nose. So it's like, <laughs> so, um, so those sorts of uh, Glenn here, he'd sort of grown up in Ontario Park. So when he was teaching me, this has actually sounded much more like a barn owl than mine does. Um, but it, it was those little kind of things that we, we, we teach each other and then we'd share and we'd remix or the different stories about the different plants, like the Douglas fir trees and the sort of the feet and tail that are sticking out of the cones and the ears inside. And we'd all have a story for that. And, um, um, so I always thought that's how education is. You share, you remix, nobody's ideas of their own. You give credit back to whoever taught you or whoever they told you they got that from originally. And, and that's just how education was. I probably saw my first contract later on in my mid twenties where somebody tried to get me to write something in that gave them, um, you know, that meant that any ideas I shared with them would become their ideas and their copyright. And I remember saying to them, well, I can't do that because these ideas come from generations worth of people. These are not my ideas per se, I'm just remixing them. And um, so it wasn't really till I was doing my masters and 
um, I was sort of running um, the Master of EdTech's um, community feed that I started to see this uh, this um, word OER, and I started saw it first from Tannis Morgan because uh, um, she's always talking about OERs on uh, on Twitter. And so I attended my first OER conference last year. Um, it was lovely, it was in Galway. And I was supposed to actually attend uh, the OE Global last year. I just unfortunately couldn't afford to. So um, plus side of that, that's how I ended up getting the BCIT grant though. Um, so it's, um, yeah. Anyhow, when I when I first you know started going to and attending these conferences in like the conference in in, in Galway, I, I was looking at everything and I'm like, okay, well, this is going back to this whole world that I worked in here where we were remixing everything and resharing everything. And isn't that just what education's all about? Like when I worked as a classroom teacher, I used to create stuff and share stuff. When we did our little kids science show there, it was all about uh, creating works for teachers to, to use and to share and to bring science to life in their classrooms. But at the conferences, there seemed to be a disconnect. There wasn't a lot of the younger teachers there that, uh, um, that, that could use the, the OER content. Um, I was questioning whether those teachers actually knew the term to, to get that content and to, to look it up. Um, and uh, there seemed to be a lot of people building great things, but where was it going? And I've been noticing the same problem in my master's. So we're getting asked to build OERs quite a bit in my master's at the moment. Um, but I'm with the majority of students in our program, they're just putting up pages. Um, this is Ella, by the way. Um, they're putting up pages for the um, uh, and building these OERs for their class assignments. But then I think they just get left and they don't get shared with anybody beyond the people in our actual class. And so uh, when I was getting ready for this talk, and that's what gave me the idea for the talk. Um, uh, and so when I was getting ready for this talk, I decided to ask in my current master's class about, um, you know, what they saw some of the problems being around people understanding what OERs were all about. And this is the crazy thing is the student that answered me who's, who's, you know, she's a bright student and all the, oh, all the rest of it. Sorry, I'm trying to get um, rid of the one thing so I can, my picture of you guys is sitting right in, over top of the writing. So Danielle, do you mind just reading what it says there? Because I can't see all of it. All right, it says, hi Erica. I'm going to pose an unhelpful question to you which might prove to be helpful. I'll be vulnerable and admit that I don't understand most of your post. Actually, I still don't really understand OERs beyond the context of this course. Are we talking Wikipedia? Have we stopped shaming Wikipedia? Are OERs just technical blogs? Are hipster travel couple blogger sites OERs? I didn't actually realize OERs were a thing. Those are my embarrassing questions. Why they, why they may be helpful is this. My challenges are in understanding what they are, where to find them, what their purpose is, and evaluating the validity of them. I don't think my educator friends know about or use OERs. They either also don't know about them or are concerned about the quality of information. I think they're all too busy marking and filing paperwork to create OERs. I don't know how to use hashtags, glad millennial. My guess would be that OERs need to be advertised better to educators, even sold by answering those questions I had above. But this looks very cool. Would you be able to give a brief pitch for OER, OE Global? Apologies for offering you more questions than answers. So if we've got somebody who's in a master's program for educational technology and they don't know what OERs are, this completely paints the picture for what the problem or what one of the problems and one of the challenges is out there right now. And I mean, ultimately, um, the whole reason why I, you know, sort of put this, this idea out there is because, um, uh, 
it's because I think what's happening here is I think we're speaking a different language than the majority of teachers that are working out there are doing are speaking. And so it, I think there's a bunch of people who are creating OERs and it's not getting into this community and vice versa, the content from this community isn't getting back out there to the, the, peop, the teachers that are working and needing the content or the homeschooling families or, um, uh, or the, the, the community ed teachers, um, you know, the various different parties, parties that there are out there. And so, um, I have a bit of a background in, um, and I'm glad we have somebody else. Uh, it's Anita, Anita that you that did, has done the marketing, right? Um, I have a bit of a background putting together campaigns and stuff like that and, uh, and building niche audiences. And I know that there's some other people here that have done some of that work before too. And so what I'm hoping is that we can start to tackle this issue and maybe have some steps at the end of this that we can start to do to put into play so that um, that uh, we can um, do some community awareness building and and uh, get the resources into the hands of the people that can use them. Uh, so with that, I've got a bunch of questions to start off with here. And so um, it's the reason why I'm in this room is because I've got a board back here. Um, Danielle, I'm still gonna run into the problem right now with um, not being able to read what the questions I wrote on the screen. If you don't mind reading them, and then I will be the, um, the secretary in the background here. And if anybody thinks of any additional questions to, to, to add, please, by all means, jump in. And I'm gonna try to not kill my computer while I balance it on the chair. There we go. Okay, I'll go forward with the question. Uh, Erica asks, um, what do you see as the challenges to awareness of open educational resources? Well, I can, uh, I can start from my own experience. Um, Teachers are always very passionate about their profession. But when you tell them about OERs, within one minute, it is about copyright. And then you see their, uh, their, 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 maybe their interest disappear completely. So I think it's a challenge. Uh, challenge is how can you uh, tell people, tell teachers about OER, uh, connecting them to their passion, so connected and directly to their uh, to their teaching and the way I approach it, uh, and that seemed to work, but it is not scalable, is that uh, every teacher has some barriers which prevent them from to teach uh, the 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 optimal lesson they want, and um, to analyze how OER can help them to uh, to overcome those barriers, then you have their attention. But okay. there is no one way to do this. It's not, not a recipe for that. So that, I, I consider that as one of the big challenges. Thank you, Robert. Um, uh, um, Alan, can you turn on record just so that, so that when I go to write this up for all of us later, I don't you know, forget anything? We're already recording. Oh, we are. Oh, perfect. OK. Any other people that uh, want to jump in on the challenges? I would say uh, it's not earth shattering or anything like that, but uh, time in this case, or kind of a focus on teaching or research or whatever they're doing at the moment. Um, a professor or like faculty seems to focus on that and um, sometimes do not hear uh, about uh, the good stuff of uh, open education resources. This is Lois. Um, I would say also um, just the idea of change. This is something different and change is scary. And they, you know, faculty a lot of times have been doing things in the same way. They know how that works. They know how that works with their students. And um, so the idea of change is, is hard. Um, I think that's one of the silver linings of the pandemic, at least where we are, is we're seeing everybody a little more willing to look at different ways to change. Um, 
and and moving outside the box um, towards things like this that they would not consider before because it just seemed a little out there. But um, I, I have found that, that that's definitely a silver lining of all this. Anybody else want to add in? I have kind of an unusual, I don't know. It's just something that I've noticed is, um, and I don't think it's deliberate because it's going to sound really negative, but a misperception among some faculties about what students would actually consider affordable. Um, I hear a lot when I'm talking about OER, well, my textbook really isn't that expensive. And then they rattle off the price and I'm like, that would have been a big expense for me as a student. And, and so they think it's reasonable in their mind because it's something that they could easily afford, but they don't really think about the fact that their students might not be in the same situation. So like I said, that's kind of a weird one and it's not something that I think is done deliberately. So yeah. Yeah, I, I think there is something where yeah. teachers also, like some teachers make an additional income from that, which yeah. I think, I think, you know, sort of this whole world potentially is challenging, you know, a source of their income, which is, you know, might cause, cause concern. I actually dropped a master's class once for that very reason. Um, the, the person teaching it wanted you to purchase the book that they had just published and it was really expensive. So yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I I uh, um, I kind of think that you know providing my materials is part of teaching the class, so it it would never occur to me to charge for them. Um, <laughs> but it it's um, I mean, but we're also coming from a different worlds, right? You know, we've been teaching. You know, I'm teaching online now, right? And we're in a digital that provide all that content where they're coming from a way to get students that content before they had to have it in some printed format. Uh, anybody else? Yeah, I've got um, one issue I came across in my research is, I, I don't know if this is true, this is one person's perception was uh, about the culture of sharing. So it looks like professors are based on this one person's perspective, it looks like professors are willing to create OER, but less willing to borrow and adapt. And, and I guess part of that is if you create an OER, then you've created a course, you can put that, that on your resume, whether there's any compensation for creating something simply because it's an OER, I don't know. But there was, it seemed that there was more pride in creating an OER and that to borrow someone else's, maybe that's perceived as being lazy or, so the, 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 the philosophy of OER and the culture of open education is not fully ad, uh, adopted if, uh, among some people. Uh, Daniel, I can confirm uh, that uh, for a bit, but I can also uh, give some counter examples. I actually did the research about in the Netherlands about uh, the, the about reuse because I think reuse of OER is uh, is a rather under research uh, topic uh, when when you uh, when you uh, look at research about OER it's always about sharing but uh, less about reuse and the only thing which is uh, research deep in reuse is which barriers exist but I did an, uh, I did an, a study in the Netherlands um, uh, where I, I, I wanted to find out more about, okay, uh, is reuse actually going on? And uh, what I found, uh, for, uh, for instance, is that uh, teachers uh, uh, teaching computer science are really in, into reuse and uh, uh, much more than another group which I compared with, and those are uh, teachers uh, in, in nursing education, which were much less. And uh, when I uh, was looking for some explanations for that, uh, the teachers from uh, computer science told me, well, it's in our, it's, 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 it's in, uh, yes, in our genes. Uh, uh, when they all uh, are, uh, are able to program, so uh, our computer programs, and they say we never make computer programs from scratch. We are always looking for codes, open source software or whatever. And they do 
naturally uh, the same for uh, for resources. So they they, uh, uh, they 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 are not creating resources from scratch or hardly doing this, but uh, they they um, uh, they start looking for something in the field, and uh, which can uh, which they can use, and uh, and it's not always. Oh, we are in the in the smallest sense of the world uh, because they, they, don't, they if they don't want to adapt they actually don't need actually uh, uh, an, an, a creative commons license they only need uh, open access but not the the, 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 the license to they give them the right to adapt them so so they, they they are rather aware of that and that is for that is some something i, I discovered and uh, uh, unfortunately i had too little data to see that for all fields so but but um, uh, well, we've written a paper about this, and uh, it, it is uh, accepted and will be published in open practice one of these days. So uh, there you can read more about it. Excellent. You'll have to put the link up to that in the um, comments uh, on the on the. Um... Yeah, it is. It is not published. This uh, this this issue uh, in which this uh, research is done is not published. It will be in the next issue of uh, open practice. Well, we'll have to. Okay. Have start a way that we can then share it with the group afterwards um, um, so that when you do publish it that we can I can yeah. email it or send it out to everybody um, thank you for that and and that makes sense because that whole computer science like if they're if they're a real computer scientist then they've been using open source in part of the open source culture for a while um, since that's not new um, versus you know nurses, they wouldn't really have been exposed to that culture. Interesting. I wanna, sorry, I just want to add, uh, part of my research involved someone representing the open source community, and he confirms what you say. This is, again, one person speaking, but he is a person who strongly uh, is involved in the open source community, and he was trying to bring the culture of open source community into the open education community. Um, and one thing I would like to add is uh, Ross added a comment in, in the chat saying uh, a motivation for OER is the intrinsic rewards for creating OER. Uh, yeah, I would agree with that too. And I wrote about that a while ago, um, getting people to create OER, and then you get that emotional kind of engagement and attachment. Um, and then they're likely to adopt after that as well. Yeah, um... I think one of the things we're talking about here too is there is, I think, a bit of a difference because um, in this, and this is something we're going to get into later on, there's different silos. So a lot of what I'm hearing here are from the silos of sort of the, the more post-secondary academic uh, academics, whereas uh, if we're looking K to 12, um those teachers are generally in survival mode most of the year and so they're constantly reusing other people's content there it may not be i mean i think there is pride in what they create but they also don't have the issue of if they find something good from somebody else of of reusing it um and i really think we're missing that k-12 to sector of teachers with the term oer at the moment um I also think there's, then there's, we've got that whole community educator part through museums and parks and things like that, who um, I don't think BC is unique in the in culture that Interpretation Canada had, where, well, the name Interpretation Canada, clearly BC is not unique um, in that that's a sharing culture too, but they don't know, this is not a word they're familiar with right now too, so. Um, so I think we've got different layers of the issue here, which which is is good to understand. Anybody else before we move on to the next question? Or another slice into um, everybody says, yeah, sharing's good. I'm into it. Um, I used to do some online talks about this, and um, I would put up a blank whiteboard and I would ask this question: What are the barriers to sharing? And uh, I was astounded by how much people um, critically looked at their own work and said, my work's not as good as others. Um, I, I'm not, I don't think this is good enough to put out there. It's not refined. Um, I'm not, um, I don't compare to the person X who's a big name in the field. So I think there's a lot of self-criticism of people's own work and they don't, um, they don't see the value. Like they miss the whole value um, in, in their own work. Um, 
and I think there, there was um what was that video by Derek Sievers about um, like just just having one person saying what you did means something to me just flips the switch um, for other people and um, but I think there's a lot of self criticism that stops people from sharing. Well, I can support that point, Alan, it, through my research in that. Uh, People who, who begin to get involved in the open education uh, world feel that way until they build confidence in the community. Another thing is that people who get involved in, in building OER, the more they, they become aware of it, the more they get involved, the more their community builds. And so once the confidence within the community builds, then people may feel more comfortable sharing what they've got. Um, and, and Sarah, put in the chat that imposter syndrome is is real and and yeah that, that very much is a situation with people new to open education um and one thing i'd like to add to what um, erica was saying earlier well i worked at the museum of the canadian museum of nature for a while and that's a place where people are used to working face to face and the knowledge of technology there was quite low in fact i had developed um a, a small training module for for someone having done a, a small needs analysis prior to that. And once I was done, I was, once it was done, I was told, oh, well, we don't want a tech-based training. We want face-to-face -face, uh, because the staff aren't very much used to tech. And uh, so, okay, fine. So they have tech issues. And so that becomes a barrier to using OER because they don't even have the basic will or skills uh, for tech use. And now that we're in this pandemic, uh, there's an issue in that, well, how, how does a place like that deliver educational programs if a lot of the staff are afraid or, or not used to working with technology? So there's several layers of, of barriers there to, to working with OER. And that's a really good point is that, um, that I mean, with OER, that is a difference, it's that, that tech component. And I just want to add the point from Robert here saying that in the Netherlands, there is a national network for a uh, national platform for sharing OER in K-12. And there's a, a website linked there. Um, yeah, maybe maybe that's one thing that would help is, is to have national communities as, as one uh, enabler to OER use. That's great. Um, uh, can somebody take a note of just because I'm obviously not taking a note of the website? Can somebody take a note of the website so that we can put it uh, in our notes later? We'll save the chat for you, Erica. Oh, thank you. Okay, so going on to our next uh, question. Can somebody read that? Here we go. Uh, for OER creators, what are your challenges in getting your OERs to your end users? I think uh, uh, making it findable. So that is the, 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 the work of uh, adding metadata, adding tags, uh, making, uh, yeah, uh, 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 creating uh, some kind of, 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 of manual maybe in which you describe when it is a, a, a larger OER, uh, for instance, uh, what goal it has, uh, uh, how, how much it takes, uh, uh, how much time it, uh, it, it will take and so on. Uh, those, those, those things are typically found in, uh, in commercial materials, but are uh, hardly uh, not, not present in OERs. And that makes it harder for their end users, which can be other teachers which will reuse their OERs, or can be students who want to uh, use these OERs, to find out if, if the, the, those are uh, OERs they, uh, they actually need at that, uh, for the goal they, 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 they are looking for. So I think that is for OER creators a challenge how to, uh, to, to with, with as less work as possible, how to uh, make it findable in such a way that it is findable uh, uh, for, for, for people and, and, and usable for people who, who, uh, who, who will uh, come across it. Uh, and uh, I, I don't think that, or I, and, and I therefore think, and that's actually the way we, we try to implement uh, 
uh, OER projects in the Netherlands, the, that uh, creating OERs is not uh, one single person, it's teamwork. Uh, so you need, for instance, a librarian who can uh, assist you in uh, all the nitty gritty details of copyright, who can assist you in adding the metadata, who maybe can assist you in uploading it to, uh, to a repository. Uh, so, so that's, that's actually the, uh, uh, the, the way we, we think it will work because teachers, uh, teachers uh, don't want to do those things. And in, most, in, in, in many cases aren't able to do those things. So uh, this is Anita. Robert, um, I, I'm a big fan of, of the idea of trying to push more metadata in these digital platforms because uh, if I understand you correctly, it helps with discovery. And uh, so, for example, in the link I put in the press books, there is a, a section in the book information where you can add uh, subject tags. And of course, the uh, press books itself is formatted to preserve style. Uh, tags, HTML style tags, and so uh, as well as um, the uh, embedded hyperlinks. So I feel that those are the kinds of things that make OER discoverable in your regular search engines, like your Googles and your Yahoo's and your Bing's, and that helps reach an audience beyond your OER audience, but perhaps even larger audience. Some of these intro OER quote unquote textbooks actually could be quite accessible to your lay reader who's maybe just interested in learning a little bit more about art history or you know biology or geology so if 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 that's kind of what you're talking about i i, I also think that that's something that um could be implemented actually fairly simply you just need somebody who kind of understands where to put the metadata like what what slot that goes into so I think what you're hitting on here too, Anita, is we need education to OER developers around how to use metadata because you just have to go over to YouTube and look, and especially in, in educational communities where it's appalling um, that they haven't used the proper titling, they haven't used their descriptions in a way to allow people to find that content. Well, I, I can't, I mean, again, I'm kind of a newcomer to the field and I can't speak for them, but I, I, I my, Impression is yes that that they, uh, you know, when I get a word document from an author, I usually have to clean up the code before I upload to Pressbooks because there's these little weird little styles that get like stuck in there, right? That random styles that mean nothing but they'll screw up the the HTML. So I go in there, I clean those out, and make sure that the H1 heading is the H1 heading, the H2 heading is properly tagged, H3, um, and and so I would tend to agree that that's that's a issue and. On the flip side of it, you know, kind of as you and Alan and I are familiar with, we come from more of that kind of outside marketing. It helps promote your book. If you can make it accessible in a Google search, um, you know, that gets OER out of the little silo of just the OER community, which is, you know, a little bit insular. I mean, I've attended some sessions where they're talking about where do we store these OER, you know, publications so we're not creating silos, right? And we don't have a standard. I mean, it's much too early to have a standard. But on the other hand, I think we have tools that can make OER accessible to a greater target audience, right? Uh, you know, your mass market lay reader, your open access journal, right? Um, you know, I do some editing for a company that their job is to help non-native English speakers prepare their manuscripts so they'll be accept and then match them according to journal metrics and subject matter to a journal where they'll hopefully have the best chance of getting published, which then improves their own, you know, status in the community. And these are trends I think that we'll start seeing that we can apply in OER as well to improve the visibility and also the legitimacy, right? I mean, we want to get past the you get what you pay for. Just because it's free doesn't mean it's not any good. And that's my big thing. It's like I want OER, like I want you to click on an OER publication from us and say, hey man, I would pay 50 bucks for this book, right? And then the other advantage of EOR is we can make it relevant and keep it current, right? We're not, you know, the brand new edition actually is like 20 years old because, you know, it took that long to get all the copyrights in place. So anyway, that's kind of my little, okay, I'll get off my soapbox now. <laughs> no, well, that was a wonderful soapbox. Um, one thing I just had a question of why I was listening to you too is, um, uh, can 
can how many can you people raise their hands if they they're familiar and and um i'm gonna need either alan or danielle or somebody to look and see how many hands raise who are familiar with what search uh engine optimization is How many hands do we see there? So, 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 so. I know what it is, but I'm not able to uh, to realize it. Okay, okay. Um, and so, um, of the people who do know what it is, how many of you know how to to properly do it to to utilize like do key re re keyword research and um, and utilize that search engine optimization? Yeah. yeah. So Alan does. And uh, Anita does. I figured you did. Um, um, anybody else? I'm a bit like Robert. I recognize the importance of it, uh, but I probably would leave that to an expert, uh, okay. such as yourselves. So maybe, like, just just in thinking ahead here, maybe something like uh, SEO, like a workshop on it. Um, might be something that might be useful to do for the OER community at some stage of the game. So, cause that makes a huge difference in search engines, being able to find it, find your content. I was thinking that yesterday when, um, uh, I'm probably mispronouncing his name terribly. Uwald was, was talking, he was talking about his, um, the, the tech that they've built um, to basically pull in um, different OERs um, for big students to search through the, his tech base. In order for that to work, you've got to have all this stuff like what Anita was talking about with metadata on there. You also need the words to be searchable under the terms that people would be looking up for them. Although um, I could do a quick screen share and show you how Pressbooks does it. Pressbooks actually has this really nice, you start typing in like a, a subject tag, like primary, secondary, top subject tag, and it'll actually fill in the one that's most appropriate. So you can like make sure that you're using those tags if, if, if yeah. I, uh, I just, if uh, you allow Anita to do her screen share there. And then you can see how the press books, I can't yeah. show you the dashboard, but I can show you the where, how it's like all associated with press books. And you can see, okay, it's still not letting me share. Hang on, hang on, hang on. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, now you can. I almost made you host. <laughs> oh no, don't make me host. I don't want that much responsibility. <laughs> I don't either. <laughs> okay, so can you see this now on the on the screen? So this is the humanities yeah. uh, book and I, I was very intentional about trying to include metadata. So there is a field and I can't show you the dashboard because we shut the dashboard down after it was published, but um, you can see here now you have a primary subject and what happens is when you type, start to type in, it'll bring you a drop down menu that'll let you choose. So that way you don't make the mistake of using a subject tag that isn't going to be very common. It, it kind of guides you to the one that's most common or maybe falls under like one of the library standards, the book catalog standards. And then you have the ability to fill in all these secondary, right? So presumably someone who's looking for say maybe some information on the French Revolution could actually find this book in a Google or a Bing search. And this is the search engine optimization, SEO that Erica mentioned, right? Um, and then I also saw a fascinating discussion where they were talking about social media hashtags. Now, I don't think that's something you can embed in a digital platform. Um, it would be nice if you could. I mean, there might be a way maybe to put it in the, um, the meta uh, description right? Meta title or meta description. I think Alan and Erica, you know what I'm talking about. Like maybe hashtags could go in there. They would be invisible, but I don't know if they would get picked up uh, in a search engine. And then uh, speaking of social media, it never hurts to help promote your, you know, OER textbooks just in social media and make sure, again, you throw in some hashtags. So that, again, they'll get found by a, a wider general audience. Great. Um, now, on that note, um, if I were to say niche communities and forums and community groups and stuff like that, how many people are familiar with those here? Okay, I see Alan raising his hand. 
Let's see a few head shakes. Okay, so so that's also like I I think Alan, I think I think we need a whole pile of I think this is something that we need in the future is some some workshops on some of this stuff. Uh, niche community building. Uh, anybody who actually wants to build a campaign afterwards too, I'll I'm happy to uh, put up um, some well. I'm happy regardless to put up some some lessons showing you how to do this because I've already built all these lessons for my DCIT students. So niche community building. Um, there's all sorts of different um, little niche spaces out there. Probably some of you are already using them where they're like Facebook communities, they're uh, subreddits, they're uh, forums that particular communities have built out there. Um, they might be groups over on um, LinkedIn and things like that, where you've got like a really hardcore community that's interested in a particular topic. And so those communities, if you're building on something like, um, if you're building OERs, say, on um, aerodynamics, uh, I've, I've played around in some of the plane communities before for a TV series that we are helping to promote. Um, if you go in there and you start nerdily talking about and sharing some of your content and also nerdily engaging with some of their content, you can get like some huge advocates behind your OERs and those little, little sub communities. And, and it, it takes time. Um, but then those, those people in those communities, um, as long as you're taking an interest in them as well, they go, they can go out there and they can be the champion of the, the OERs and the content that you're creating out there. The, the tough part of that part is it's going beyond your current community as opposed to, I think right now we keep talking to other OER creators and we're not going into those little end user groups that could really use, use the content and get excited about it um, and the possibilities. Other people want to add to this challenges? Well, I wanted to say something was that, um, that, okay, so one option is to provide training on on, on some of these skills. Uh, I'd like to point out that Pamela had her hand open uh, up earlier saying that she also knew about these SEOs. Um, and so one third of the people here have, have well, one third right now, one, yeah, one third, one quarter have, have, have these skills. But one thing that was in my research, and this relates a little bit to what Robert was saying, and it relates a little bit to what you're saying about niche communities, in my research, it was about ecosystems uh, of, of different roles in, in higher education that were involved in, in open education. And so my alternative to what you're suggesting as training is um, working with people in different roles, because one thing that was found to be helpful in, in, a, in, in an ecosystem, for example, a university, is that people from different roles work together. So you don't just have the lone wolf developing a course, developing an OER, you would have a librarian, you would have an instructional designer helping a professor, um, people with knowledge of, of different things. Um, and so that that's one view is to rather than learn the skills in case you're not capable, the, the alternative is to go and look for people in your community or in these niche communities, as you're talking about, to find the people to do that work. Yeah, and that goes back to to uh, to the teamwork that Robert said earlier, um, which I think is absolutely important. And I mean, obviously, why probably Anita is a godsend to her team. Um, some we do have an issue here, though. A lot of the universities don't have these people. Uh, and the colleges don't have these people. They might have marketing departments, but they don't really know how to do this. I, I would pipe up and say that I like this idea of these niche groups, though, to then just ask for help. A lot of people are willing to give, you know, free help. Oh, absolutely. Like, right. So it occurred to me, like the thought popped into my head is that for a while I was a member of the Council of Scientific Editors. And there's a group of people who could help with all sorts of, you know, parts of getting these OER publications done. And it would be a twofold uh, learning process because I could make them more aware of what we're doing in OER. But then again, I could find somebody who could help me with say, hey, how would you, you know, where would you find a, a list of say, um, you know, ideal subject tags, you know, that, you know, that would be most widely used for an educational setting as opposed to say maybe IEEE engineering, you know, internet standards. 
Yeah, so even, um, so this week, um, I, for my talk on accessibility yesterday, um, I wanted to, not we never ended up having the time to share it, but I'm gonna share it later in the, um, on, on the Connect platform. Um, but we had, I wanted somebody who, aside from Lori and I, who had a disability that could share, you know, her experiences with online education and stuff like that. And um, it was through those niche communities that I got several offers to talk right away. And so I knew my friend Kat was really engaged in those niche communities. So I sent Kat an email and I said, hey, do you mind? And because she's trusted in those communities, she was able to, I think by the end of the day, I couldn't interview everybody, I only had the time to do one person, but you know, I had four offers and they all wanna be involved in the podcast sort of uh, later on that we produced from it. So, um, and she was able to do that really quickly. And because she's been a part of that community, they trusted her. And because she trusts me, you know, it, yeah, so, they work. Um, anybody else? Just my, I mean, I, I niche community, it bothers me a little bit and um, not the idea, but um, like you have to be active in these spaces too. It's yeah. not just going in there saying like, here's my stuff. Um, and it's more getting into the area of uh, professional personal learning networks where you have these multiple places and not saying like everybody has to go out and spend all their time in these. Um, but um, there, there is sort of a piece about finding groups um, to be active in and also um, somewhat stepping out of those. And that's, that's a hard, there's a, a concept that came across a long time ago called um, structured serendipity. Um, and it was a, um, I can, I'll find the reference later, but he was a, an economist, um, but he made deliberate um, approaches. He said he would spend two hours a week reading something out of his economic discipline. So he would read biology papers or um, something out of his normal flow of information to pick up ideas. Um, he also did things like once a week, he would go to a different location to work in a different spot. Um, and it's somewhat of just, it creates a little bit of potential serendipity um, to um, either read something you normally wouldn't, to enter a discussion where you normally wouldn't. Um, and so, I mean, some of these communities are the ones that are, are academic and are discipline specific ones that aren't very active in OER. So, I mean, that's, that's an obvious yeah. way, um, but there's just like, um, it sounds like these communities to me, they sound like these little separate islands. And I think there are a lot of overlapping uh, communities. And I mean, th this conference is one. And so you'll interact with people you don't normally do. Um, and then you'll run, you might bump into them in some other context. And so, Having as much of that, um, even small scale interaction um, does build up over time. And so um, I'd be more interested in doing things where people, I mean, personal learning networks or professional learning networks are kind of old now, but they're still really vital um, being so flooded with so many pieces of information. I, I second that, Alan. I, I, like, I like that idea that, you know, go outside of your typical communities. Yeah, no, that's great. Okay. Um, anybody want to add anything else to this before we go on to the next question? Okay. The next question put up by Erica is, who do you think your end users are? I think that depends. Uh, both teachers and uh, students, uh, self-learners, professionals in the field, um, uh, that's maybe also one of the problems. You don't know who your end users are. And uh, you can, that's also one of the hesitations I, I come, come across uh, for, for the teachers to share their materials to say, I don't know where it will end. Uh, 
will end up, and maybe it will end up in uh, contexts where I don't want to end it up. So uh, they they are very uh, feeling very comfortable by sharing their resources with the people they know, and they share those informally. And I think uh, Martin Weller has uh, named that dark reuse, but. Um, uh, the, uh, because you don't know who your end users are, you only have some uh, some imagination by it, uh, makes it hard. Well, and that's, that's I, 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 you're totally hitting on the, the nail on the head there with so many people. It's, it's uh, um, I, coming from storytelling fields, you know, um, you start to really, you know, dissect and figure out who different audiences are for different things. So um, say, for example, years ago, um, uh, Saskatchewan show, uh, crop, crop dusting show, I can't remember what it's, oh, dust up what it was called. Um, one of the things like, you know, that we did when we were figuring out how do we reach the audience for this show was literally make a list of every per different sort of overlapping community and group that might be interested in this series. And, and then it's, you know, it's literally going out and finding those groups to engage them. Part of the problem, I think, and goes back to Danielle's and Robert's point on teamwork is, you know, that can be a daunting, daunting task of trying to reach all those different communities too. Um, okay, so we had students and teachers. Uh, anybody else have comments on the end users? Uh, what again? One of the findings in, in my research was you just you just don't know, and that, and, and that's the that seems to be the nature of openly licensed materials is that you put it out there, um, and you don't know where it ends up. Someone people know who created it. But the creator, this this came up in a point yesterday. That, but the creator doesn't know who ends up using it, and so to that end, what it was a bit challenging is that you're you, whenever you're designing these things, you're designing for some kind of audience, whether it's an imagined one or a real one, and um, you don't know who you're going to reach. You don't know if the people you've designed it for will use it. And you don't know if there's a different population that will take it up and use it, maybe adopt it. So I think part of it is having to accept the mystery of who will use these things. Um, perhaps this is something that goes in, that needs to be going into the metadata is explaining who this is intended for. Um, and yeah, it, it's it's there's a lot of guesswork involved because the the open world is so is so vast. Anyone who's got access to the internet can come and use these things. Yeah, but I don't, I, it, people can make, uh, uh, well, uh, Ellen already uh, introduced the word serendipity. And I think that also uh, comes for OERs. It can end in contexts which you never have, uh, had, had, can, couldn't imagine. Uh, you, 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 are, uh, you have created an OER uh, uh, made for geography. And then uh, maybe it, it has something in it where, but makes it uh, very attractive for uh, teachers' economy, and they use it. Uh, and you, 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 and you, you haven't uh, um, uh, seen that when you create it, and haven't that in, in their mind because the creativity of people in using materials is so large. You can't, uh, you can't imagine that. And Anita added a point here in the chat saying. Uh, for digital platforms, press books, and I believe LibreText, Google Analytics, can help answer this question in broad brushstrokes. Uh, for example, uh, based on the location, the type of format, the number of visits. So the, I guess there's some form of tracking of some resources. Yeah, we, we, we should also remember that, that the, the most type of reuse which is done is uh, reusing the idea. You get inspired by looking at the OER from other people, but you don't reuse this OER, but you reuse the idea in your own uh, in your own um, uh, uh, teaching or in your own uh, learning materials. And Anita seems to agree with that point. Great. 
Yeah, I mean, I personally find that unexpected to be exciting. And I think, you know, when we discover that there's an opportunity there, right? Of, okay, this group's really enjoyed this. I have this other thing that I would love to develop an OER on. And maybe knowing that this is how it's been used in this way, you know, I, you, you can learn from, from that. It, as long as, as you say, you've got that data to track stuff and to, to have that understanding of where it's going. Other thoughts before we go on to the next? No? Data and analytics are fine, but nothing ever supersedes when someone out of the blue contacts you and says oh, I thank agree. you and, and, and that you never expected. I, I will take that over data any day. Yeah, I'm Alan, I'm fully, fully, fully with you. I'm, I'm more of the, um, I mean, it's good to know this stuff, but, uh, but it's those um, anecdotal moments that, that sort of lift my heart. Um, I, when, we, when we launched our, um, our nature series uh, and we had this, uh, uh, the knowledge keeper for the, the couch and First Nations um, sort of talking about, you know, how we're all connected to the land and we're all indigenous to somewhere. And we've just, you know, a lot of us have lost and forgotten that connection. And there was a gentleman in Britain who sort of commented back on, on how it had made him cry because it had made him remember. And like, that's, those are the stories that, that, that stick with you, right? Yeah, well, and <laughs> this is one of my hobby horses, but like, you know, often when people talk about public domain, it's like, oh, you don't have to give attribution. I hate that. Like that's the minimum level of legal compliance. And so um, I share a lot of my photos on Flickr and someone wrote me a long time ago and said, hey, um, I'm gonna reuse your picture. Um, and I wrote back and I did this whole explanation. Oh, you know, it's licensed Creative Commons. That means you can use it. And, um, and you don't have to like ask permission. And they wrote back and said, yeah, I know all about that. I just thought you'd like to know. And that just, <laughs> that really changed everything. And so um, I switched all my photos to be public domain as an experiment. Um, and um, I get all the time, especially from musicians who want to reuse, you know, uh, photographs for their cover art or their, um, their albums. And um, they just want to express appreciation. And these are like small time independent musicians who are not making a lot of money. Um, and the fact that they will reach out um, to acknowledge to me an act of gratitude and graciousness mm -hmm. um, is, is so much more important and, and fulfilling as for someone who creates stuff. Yeah. I wanted to pitch in as well. And I, I, I really, I agree with you, Alan, uh, just because it's public domain and says use it for free. Um, one of the things I've, I've tried to push for is um, kind of, you know, as our role of educators, one of the things that I think is important to kind of help students understand is that um, this appreciation is really, it's basically giving credit. You're not getting paid for your work, but, you know, get, giving someone credit, I think is kind of a bigger picture uh, role modeling we need to do is like make sure that you give credit and so I, I push for making sure that even if something's labeled CCO or public domain that we still credit it because it's kind of this whole idea of modeling how you show appreciation respect and share knowledge properly it's like there should always be credit you should always know who you know people deserve credit musicians artists they all deserve credit for having produced you know for their creation so yeah Absolutely. I actually, when I'm teaching that stuff, uh, I um, um, I very clearly outlined, you know, in the um, uh, in my um, notes, you know, where the like, you know, the rubric where the marks are going, and everybody who forgets to um, give credit, then <laughs> that's the last time throughout the class they forget to give credit because because uh, they end up getting dinged badly in their uh, in the grade, and then and but then because they're, we're building stuff and they're going to need to give credit throughout the rest of the class. Hopefully it then sort of, you know, starts to become automatic for them. That's kind of my goal. I, I'm, I'm not really a mark driven person, but my, my goal with it is so that they, it becomes ingrained in them. And um, okay. Lois is supporting this point that uh, 
citing the sources is important and and this is the, something that lois teaches in information liter literacy courses and i would add that i agree that in in north america i think we have a culture that uh, finds it important to cite your sources whereas it seems that different in, in different locations that's not valued and in fact simply copying someone's materials is is seen as the better way to do things with copying and not necessarily citing the person. Yeah, I, I, I would say um, it's kind of one of those things like we kind of a basic tenant, like you can use other people's ideas. You just wanna make sure that you're not saying that you're using somebody's idea as your own, um, that you came up with this idea, but giving credit to who came with it. And um, it's just a general respect thing, not that it's, not that you can't use that idea or maybe come up with something different from that idea but that yes, you need to make sure that you're acknowledging where that idea started from. I think to add to that is knowing how to, to cite or attribute. Um, and uh, apparently with open education, with openly licensed materials, you attribute and with copyrighted, with copyright all rights reserved, you cite the work. Um, so there's that distinction. And then there's the procedure for the attribution, the procedure for the citation and all the things you have to do. You know, it's one thing to be aware of what to do. Then it's another thing to know how to do it properly. And Anita seems to like that point. Excellent. Okay. So um, what, what, in terms of those, I, I think most like, um, what are, what do you find as your challenges in, in building future OERs? We might have already covered this in some of our other slides. Anybody want to add? I don't, I don't know what you mean by future OERs. Um, well, so I, I guess um, uh, the question was more to do with um, um, there's obviously a time investment when we're creating. And in order to build databases of OER content, um, we need to and so what are what are sort of the the, the challenges that um, that get people you know and getting people to begin that process and um, and I guess building content you know over time and I think we might have covered this one in our original slide to be honest so unless anybody has anything new they want to add I'm gonna jump to the next uh, I would just add um... I would just add kind of support from uh, your peers and also from, say, your, your, your I'll call them the boss, a dean or whoever, or a chair, I'm not sure who. Uh, so um, that would be uh, one thing. Okay, support. And then that also goes back to them understanding what it is that you're doing, because, mm -hmm. yeah. In also, gets Sorry. back to the emotional part of it as well. Yeah. And, and, uh, you know, intrinsic rewards. And Anita supports that point. And what I would say in my job is sometimes it's the nature of my job sometimes limits me. I, I'm not, I don't teach directly to, to students. I work with professors. Um, but sometimes my job doesn't call for developing OER. I can do it in my free time, but the job itself doesn't always allow for it. And I think Ross has got his hand up. Um, oh, do I? Okay. I didn't mean to. Okay. But, um, in this case, though, um, I was going to say that, um, yeah, off the side of the desk, actually, that's the uh, typical sort of scenario of creating. And if that time uh, was was allocated, then uh, the nuts uh, would go pretty pretty far in terms of getting some uh, creation done. Yeah, 
Okay, so allocated time. Yeah. A time investment grant. They actually do have those at some institutions. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I like the idea. And there are a lot of comments here in the chat about having no free time. And I, I do agree with that. I think especially now in the, in the pandemic, it, perhaps pretty much everyone is, is, is stressed out. And I think what free time we do have, we probably need it to relax. Yeah, well, and I'd go so far to say in order to create our best work, we we need this we need balance in our lives and that that's been one of the real positives that I've learned through um uh through through well basically living in constant pain from my car accidents is I it's forced me to live a more balanced life which is not a bad thing um and you can actually sometimes be more productive when you're taking that time Anything else? Okay. So this is the part that um, I think is really key here is we're all talking amongst ourselves about this stuff right now, but how do we reach those people that are already creating that, uh, that content that they're basically treating in an open way, but they don't know the terminologies and they don't know the licensing and things like that. How do we reach them to, to, you know, to create sort of open licensing and on their content? I think in my experience, it's about um, building relationships uh, with, uh, with these people. And, um, you know, you may not have the relationship, but maybe your colleague does. And it's kind of a one on one approach. And I know that it would take, it takes a longer uh, time, but that's one of the things I'm learning about open education. It's, it's a long game. And so, um, but that investment in that relationship building is actually really important. That's how folks get to know about it in some ways. Um, you can also do the other kind of large scale type of um, strategies, but uh, sometimes building relationships seems to be um, one of the most effective. But what do you guys think? Do you think uh, the one on one is kind of a, an important aspect of getting to know these folks? I, uh, I don't personally like I don't that's not my role. And we have people do that. But definitely it was uh, about building relationships and finding the right connection, Ross. So I would I would definitely agree with you. It, it might be one on one. Um, it might be a group, like a group presentation. We've done that as well. But I think typically what happens is it requires a one on one so that the person who's making the contact, the faculty member who's kind of inquiring, gets a good understanding and, and, and we avoid those misunderstandings that kind of plague OER. Um, like I said, I am not personally involved in it, but I've, I've watched my my team members and supervisors enough that that's a big part of it is, is you don't pick the right project you don't or, or you pick the right people before you pick the project right because they've got to be people who are going to be willing right to trust you know they're trusting you to take them on the, on this voyage so i i would i would echo your your sentiment i also like stories too by the way and uh, i know that's um your uh, expertise um actually so i'd like to hear how you would think is uh how stories can be involved in reaching uh, people about oer yeah well i i mean i ultimately think that um as educators we are storytellers and i think a lot of storytellers are educators even if um even if they don't think of themselves that way and so i think there is like a huge market out there of different storytellers that are doing things that have different educational initiatives, um, like from documentary filmmakers to children's storytellers to that 
if they knew that there was a way that they could um, um, utilize what they're already creating to reach different audiences, to have a different purpose, um, to um, potentially, um, you know, help support some of the sort of the the ideas that they're trying to get across, whether it's like, you know, whether they've got ideas that they're creating in their stories that are around inclusivity or, um, or diversity or um, a love for our planet or all those different like, you know, things, a lot of storytellers sort of work into their stories through sort of open educational materials around that there's an opportunity there for them to share and to spread that content in a different way. Um, but we have to reach them. And unfortunately, with the storytellers, there's a little bit of a higher barrier there, just because so many of them have worked in these fields where, um, uh, you know, they're indoctrined into the whole copyright notion, and that they think that if they let something be open, they're going to lose their opportunities um, where their funding sources might be, whether it's with a publisher or whether it's with a broadcast network or, or, or something along those lines. Um, I'm, I'm kind of working um, on a sustainable funding project at the moment. And part of that is, um, and part of how we're going out there and experimenting and sharing some of our content at the moment, it's it's with that whole purpose of, um, well, one of the side purposes to the whole thing is demonstrating that there is a different way to do things than our traditional uh, methods of funding in, in, in those marketplaces. Uh, and, um, um, and that different way can be more open and things like that. With, um, I have, um, I, I, when I'm approaching that from, from our stories, I, not all of our content is open. For example, um, when I'm doing our documentary filmmaking or um, the podcasting series that we're looking at right now with working with people with disabilities, I specifically don't put an open, um, unless the person, interviewed uh, wants it to be open and they and they understand what that means. I don't put um, an open license on that content just because as a documentary filmmaker, I, um, I need to be protective of my subjects. And the reality with video is when you remix it or you remix audio, what they've shared with me could be taken out of context. Um, and so earlier I mentioned um, sort of the wonderful messages that one Tum was sharing with me um, when we were over on Salt Spring in one of our documentaries. And had I, especially in the political climate that we're just coming out of right now, had I made that content so it could have been remixable, Wentum's words, which were beautiful, could totally be taken in a very, um, in a way that could have been abused by certain groups and and taken totally out of context and as a documentary filmmaker there too um, who's been very fortunate in the fact that the first nations community um, trust me uh, and they want to create with me um, and they allow me to share their stories uh, if i were to go and do that and that get taken in a way that would be destructive um, by by somebody else who's using re remixing in a not so um, wonderful manner, um, it would it would I'd pretty much be killing my um, I'd be killing my future abilities to to work with groups like that. Um, as we're heading into this uh, project now around um, around accessibility. That was one of the big key things that um, uh, that made the difference in CAD asking and communicating what I was looking for in those communities the other day is because they trust her and Kat trusts me. She's worked with me for years, so she could tell them that no, Erica's trustworthy. 
and she also gets where you're coming from because she's had her own, you know, disability and accessibility issues along the way. Um, so, but then what I do with my storytelling, and, and this is, I think, where, you know, you, you can show with these different audiences, we, we make that free. So we make all those videos for free. So even though I'm not allowing remixing on them, you know, teachers or educators or parks or um, different community groups, they can take those videos and take them and send them wherever they wish to send them um, and use them in whatever way they wish to use them. But um, where our truly open content is around it is building additional like, you know, classroom lessons and uh, ways that you can take those, the, the content we've shared in those videos uh, further and, um, and, you know, build, you know, curriculum around them and things like that. So that curriculum, those lessons, all of that is open. Um, but I think with each storyteller, it just, it depends on where you're coming from. It depends. There's this great platform that I started using this summer uh, with uh, my animated storytelling camp, which is called Elementary. And it's designed, it's working with art, different art artists, and it's designed for kids to create these wonderful animated stories in which uh, the platform automatically credits the, the different animators that become a part of these stories. And if somebody then takes my story, um, they can then remix my story and add different elements to it. And it credits me back as, as being the, the kind of the original writer of, of whatever it is that they've adapted. So um, Laurie, who works with me, created this wonderful sort of yoga travel story for kids on there. And so people have been picking it up and remixing it into different languages, which has been lovely to see. So, but that is a tough community to crack just because because of where they've come from it's kind of like how it's um the musician community initially when it came to uh remixing stuff okay um oh, sorry just i uh, want to add from lois and anita agrees with this point uh, lois says it's such an important point that there's a time and place for making something open but that we can support OERs and also understand that there are important reasons to protect information as well. Yes, some populations are sensitive. Uh, if you have a discussion or a training session with um, a vulnerable pop population, um, such as maybe you're simply talking about uh, sexism, or if people are to be open uh, and, and truly address issues they need a secure environment. So, so that would not be a, something that, you know, if there was a recording of that and made, and that was made available, I think there would be less participation and less learning. So it would be defeat, the openness would defeat the purpose of the lesson. Uh, it's the indigenous communities sometimes that prefer not to have their materials exposed uh, in, in particular ways. In some cases, maybe they don't want them recorded in a written form. In some ways they simply don't want outside communities to know about them. Um, and sometimes it's just simply respecting that some people don't want any contribution or any form of identification uh, out into the public. Yeah, and I, I actually think that's a conversation. Um, I, I know there's a lot of people in the open, there, there is that sort of more extreme sector of the open, uh, Pop, open ed cop population that it doesn't understand why you wouldn't have things open. Um, when I was talking actually on the project and you know that that whole thing about some things having some things open and some things free and, and the reasons for it. Um, afterwards uh, at lunch um, I went to sit down at a table with somebody who I recognized and I guess she didn't recognize me initially and she was actually bad mouthing my choices in that way. And I, I kind of think that that, and I, I was okay with it. Cause I just, just, you know, I re-explained myself and I said, this is, this is why this is, um, why I've made the choices here to, 
to have this aspect so that it's not open. And, and as a documentary filmmaker, that's important for me because there is a trust with my subjects and I need to respect that trust. Um, but I think that that's something that we have to be very careful with as a community if we want to engage other people around building open and um, and sharing their content in this way and inviting them into this community is we also have to respect that there's going to be some things that they might not be comfortable with um, making open and um, rather than there being kind of that this way or the highway, we need to, to figure out how to build. So, so we show understanding and respect for other people's viewpoints and reasoning. Well, Anita contributed in the chat. She says, just because we can share an individual's information, uh, well, how, how should we do it? And my answer to that would be, first, you have to discuss things with uh, the students. Um, in for my, my view of open education is that it in the part of the openness involves choice and it involves uh, allowing the students the option to to choose to be involved. And this involves and Anita is agreeing with this. Um, it's it's about discussing things it's about offering the choice to students negotiating these things from the start and then moving forward but then that that requires the people involved to adopt especially the instructor if that's the person who ultimately can make the final decision that that uh, the expectation is that the instructor has that open philosophy in them and not everyone is that far into openness. Well, and, and I think when we're talking like the student um, uh, uh, teacher sort of role here too, we have to remember that as educators, we're in a power position with our students, whether, whether we feel that way or not, it, uh, you know, especially if you're in a graded course, um, you're, you can be more intimidating than you, um, than you, than you realize in, in your, in your student's mind. Negotiate. So, um, I guess just, um, being aware of the power dynamic. I just want to point out there's about 20 minutes left in the workshop. Okay. Um, if we're in about 20 minutes left, and I think maybe what we do is rather than um, continue with the questions here, because um, I think we've touched on a lot of these and some of the other things, let's have a look at um, brainstorming what we can actually create here to start building some awareness. Um, so I think I'll actually, I'm going to go back to the last slide I had, um, just because I think it's a good thing before building a campaign to just think of um, uh, what's important um, to, to you. And, and maybe this is like, you might be like, what what's important to you in a campaign to build awareness of the OER? Like, what would you wish to see as a part of it? I think some creativity, actually. Uh, something a little bit outside the box uh, for creating awareness. Creativity. And, and, it, and it seems like, this is Anita again, it seems like we've kind of touched on some of these, like, for example, the the cross pollination, like going outside your, that's a creative way, going outside of your normal, like, you know, uh, stomping grounds, uh, you know, just thinking of OER as education, not just open, but education in general, you know, reaching your students, the, the idea of respecting uh, people's private information and teaching students respect, again, all these things would apply outside. So I think maybe creating an awareness that OER is about education first and maybe 
open access is a benefit or open, you know, the open pedagogy is a benefit, but it's really about education first. Um, you know, I, I keep hearing all these suggestions and I, I could see them applying to any, any course or any teaching curricula. Uh, anybody else have anything that they, they would see as important in building an awareness campaign around OER that they'd like to see included? A really good um, approach is, sorry, is um, there's, there's a teaching strategy called What's In It For Me. <laughs> um, and really, I think people are gonna be engaged. They have to see what they're getting out of doing all this. Um, I think we, we often hit them too hard with openness is so great and sharing is good. Um, I think people have to find that they're um, personally getting something out of uh, being part of this um, and having finding things that will um, improve this, the work that they do. I was just going to say, I, 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 you know, again, from my point of view, I'd like to see to use the marketing term, term to leverage more of the digital tools that we have for this digital media, because the great thing about digital media is it gives you this interactivity, it gives the shareability, but it also gives you this chance to, like I said, get discovery, like a more global discovery. Um, so I would like to see, you know, more digital tools like being applied to creating awareness, which I think we can do through several methods that we've, we've kind of touched on. Yeah, with that too, one of the things that it occurred to me to do was um, sort of maybe as a part of it too, getting um, uh, a list of different sources where people can go to what's already out there, what, what have we already got that we can build on top of. Uh, and um, so that we're not completely reinventing the wheel too, right? Absolutely. Yeah, let's not all do our own little thing. And then once we get into the room, go, oh, six out of 12 of us are doing the same thing our own way. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I would, I would agree with that too. And also this is, this is Lois, sorry, um, that, um, you know, the practicality, like when you tell someone about something, you need to give them something they can take away immediately and use. I, I think that's what we're kind of touching upon, but that that's really important. Um, you know, so many times we, like, I, I've really enjoyed this conversation. I thank you all because it is, it's definitely something, it's not just pie in the sky. Like this is stuff, like I've heard some different things that I can immediately take away and use. And I think that's really important when you're building a campaign and trying to get people on your side is give them the tools to kind of get started, not just a big idea that, that they then have to figure out. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Anita. Mm -hmm. uh, this is Ross. What about uh, stickiness? I don't know if that's a marketing term or not, but uh, in this case, you know, we try different awareness campaigns, and some of them some of them stick, and some of them don't. But it'd be great if they could actually be sticky for a long time. I'm not sure how to achieve that or not, but I thought I would add to it. No, that's good. I it, the the thought had gone through my mind. I I. I at one point I had a slide about length and I was kind of hoping that this would be what we'd be moving towards is something that, you know, isn't just kind of a quick flash in the pan, but that we could hopefully build long-term. Right. And Ross, definitely a marketing term. Stickiness has got to do with engagement. So it's one thing to get a, a bunch of clicks, but it's even more significant if you can see how long the viewer is staying on the pages like how long, not just how many times they click, but how long they've stayed. And so in terms of a OER, I think it's a matter of, do they use it for just one lesson or do they start you know, incorporating the OER for like regularly, like every session, every semester, right? Do they start right. a, more of it? To me, that's stickiness. Good, so the more um, proper term is engagement. That sound, does sound better, but yeah. stickiness has its own sort of uh, flair to it too. Right, right. Well, it, it's an old, older term, I think, got to do with social media and websites, right? Yeah. And they use engagement. They also use engagement as well. Great. Thanks. Um, anything else in terms of the importance 
like things that are important that we want to have in there. Okay. More so, sessions like this. Sorry? More sessions like this. Oh, thank you. I, you guys are amazing. I, I was telling Alan beforehand that I had a fear that A, we wouldn't, uh, um, that nobody would show up. <laughs> and B, I had a fear that, uh, that uh, you know, uh, whether, whether people would want to be fully, you know, engaged or not. So I am loving you guys because uh, this is awesome. And, and I, I'm hoping that, you know, a lot of the resources that we've been talking about too, that we can, can share afterwards. Like I know Danielle keeps uh, referencing her, dis her dissertation, which I don't think is published yet, is it? So I'm hoping afterwards we can get that and, uh, and um, um, send that around to everybody for in case people are interested in reading it. Um, goals. What's our goal or goals? I think one thing to help is to figure out what kind of audience to reach. Um, because part of my understanding was, was uh, it was possibly to reach people outside of academia, uh, given that there may be a different language to use outside of academia than in. Yeah, that's a really good point. And this also might be where we have overlapping hashtags too, like, you know, okay, we know this group is using this, this term. So, um, so while we're trying to reach those different silos, uh, we use some of the terms that they, that they are using as well, but not with hijacking their term, but, you know, building and sharing overlapping in an overlapping way. And Ross suggests the hashtag open first. Yeah, that's the eventual goal is that when people are considering, um, their resources for the course that, uh, they would consider open first. And, uh, and then if there's nothing else, then publish perhaps. And uh, this actually happened in one of our institutions actually uh, in, the, in the interior in, West, in the West Kootenays at Selkirk College. And uh, there was actually kind of a courageous uh, person associated with the uh, teaching and learning center that uh, created it. Um, and, uh, you know, it was said and had some guidelines about uh, when choosing uh, resources to look at the open resources first and then if there's nothing then go on from there so I thought that was quite quite cool so anybody else who has different hashtags as we go through this um just just when I'm working with my teams on building like a campaign or an idea or we're building a new show or something like that we don't worry about something sounding silly or we put everything up there because um, the, because often, you know, it'll be something there that I, either inspires the idea we have or is the thing that everybody comes back to. And even if we have something that we really, really like, we might discover when we start to go out there and do the research that, oh, that's been used already and it's been used for something that doesn't fit with what we're trying to build. So, um, so who's our target audience? So I, I know Danielle said the different silos. I think primarily the teachers. So the teachers. Teachers and maybe also uh, the the the, the uh, yeah I don't know what uh, how you call it in English uh, the 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 education programs to uh, for, for, ed, for to to uh, to have educators. Okay, so oh the teacher teacher service programs I think it's called. Well, I don't know if you call it teacher service program, but but, but students uh, start to 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 learn uh, to become a teacher. I, yeah. I, I know, and know, and the people who are teaching them, those yeah. are also uh, uh, so both the, the students who want to become a teacher and the teachers themselves. Yeah, so that's the future actually, teachers. Maybe I should call them the future teachers. Um, 
That's actually a really good group to target because then you're, you know, they already know about it when they're, when they're doing their training. Uh, smart, smart, smart. Uh, I'm going to put community educators up here too. And I'm going to put homeschoolers up here as well, um, just simply because uh, they might not be a group that might be building stuff, although who knows with after Tim Chen's chat, they, they, they might be creating, you know, their own content that they want to share out there. Um, but uh, they're uh, definitely an end user group for the OERs that people are making. And Anita suggests targeting administrators, departments who provide funding and resources. We need to start paying people to develop OER. Yeah, I think that's one of the issues is that one of the hindrances to developing OER is that developing courses, whether they're open or not, takes a lot of effort, especially if you don't have a lot of training. So for that to be, um, for there to be an incentive for, for developing the OER is important. Though some people would see developing as OER as overlapping with course development, which in some cases, well, it's, in some cases it might be the same thing, but there can be incentive, incentives for OER, especially if there are benefits beyond OER being developed simply as courses. To add to that, one thing that I think is, is a hindrance for some people is it depends on if your institution is focused on teaching or focused on research. And as you know, Danielle, if you're, if you're tenure, your pay, your progression, whatever, your opportunities are based on research, they don't recognize OER as publishing. So, you know, that's kind of why I threw that out there because there needs to be that awareness of somehow including OER development as either professional development or tenure track, you know, accomplishments that's separate from actually getting published in an academic journal and doing research. And even in a teaching facility, again, it's, you know, you don't get credit for developing OER because it's not class hours, right? It's not student contact hours. So that's kind of why I threw that in there. Uh, Lois sends her apologies. She's leaving. Thank you, Lois, for your participation. Yeah, thank you, Lois. And, and I, I need to as well. And I, I certainly hope we'll see more of this discussion uh, perhaps in the OEG Connect. This was terrific for me. Thank you everyone so much. It was so nice to meet you. Oh, and thank you so much, Anita. And thank you for all that you, you shared and taught us along the way. One point that I would add, oh, bye Anita. One point that I would add is that uh, there's this role of teaching track where the, the focus is less on research, more in teaching. And uh, sometimes in these roles, professors don't receive much or any professional development, which is strange. Um, so I would suggest that there needs to be training for these people in development of courses and in OER um, and in incentives to do this work and to be perhaps innovators. Uh, yeah, this is Ross. Um, and actually, um, yeah, Anita's not here anymore, but uh, there is actually some universities that are kind of forward thinking uh, that do acknowledge uh, creation of OER uh, as, you know, part of their tenure track process or, or um, that sort of thing. UBC comes to mind, actually, which is cool. That is cool. Erica, we've got about five minutes left. Okay, um, so just thinking about, um, okay, we've got lots there that will probably, what's the best way, since we've got five minutes left, what's the best way um, that would be easiest for everybody to continue this conversation? And if you're interested in sort of being involved and helping to create something that we can actually take actionable steps on where would people like to see both, you know, I'll, I'll obviously put the notes up and the things we discussed over on Connect, but if we then were to create a working document to try and brainstorm our next steps in this whole process, what works for people for, for 
Do we want like a Google Doc space? Do we want to create our own little, I mean, with Story to Go, we have the abilities to create our own little private um, work group on there. Um, what, what works well for people on where their comforts are at as far as, you know, kind of continuing this whole campaign building process? And is that something that interests people? I think maybe people can express interest by replying to you and connect. Um, and mm -hmm. you're able to um, private message anybody and then figure out, um, you know, cause they'll get an email um, of a response. So that might be a way just to find out, you know, cause there might be people who weren't even in the session um, who, who might want to join in. Um, but probably I would shrug and say, well, you get to pick Erica because you're, you're sort of like, you know, rallying us on here. So I, I think, um, you know, we navigate between so many different workspaces. I don't think it's a big deal. Okay. Um, and so um, just because we only do have that very short time left here, do anybody have any um, questions um, or, or things that we haven't touched on that they or directions that they wish to go and continue kind of discussing following this? I think one thing that would help given that your strength, more one of your strengths, Erica, is, is creativity and the world of creativity in education. Um, I think maybe it would help to show a variety, maybe what we can build if, if we're capable is, uh, different versions of OER that can be used educationally, that it doesn't have to be just uh, standard formats that people are highly familiar with, for example, open textbooks and, and open courses. And I do, you know, that I say that even though open textbooks are extremely important to open education, especially in terms of access and cost, but that there's there are possibilities beyond that. Um, the, the open education is shifting a lot towards open educational practices. So I think it's important to show what possibilities are, are out there. And that uh, goes along with UDL and accessibility. It's offering a variety of possible ways to do work, uh, to represent knowledge and to include different people in developing content and designing lessons. So I think really pushing the creativity aspect is something that's important. Um, partly because it, it's one of your strengths. And I think it would attract more people from the creative fields. Okay. Thank you. Other, other thoughts, other questions, other just ideas that you want to share with people in general? Well, I can stop the screen share so I can see everybody's wonderful faces. I'm just going to stop the recording at this point. It's okay. Great. Uh, 